Hello everyone, my name is Haley Elizabeth and if you don't know who I am, this is my true crime podcast where once a week I sit down and I talk about all things true crime, ranging from murders, disappearances, cults, all the way to the biggest drug bust in history, the biggest bank heist in history, all things true crime. So if you're interested in any of that, you can subscribe and watch the visual version on YouTube every Wednesday or you can head over to Spotify, Apple, wherever you can find podcasts for the audio version every Tuesday. Now for today's case, we are going to be talking about the case of Maribel Ramos. Now, there is a lot to get through, so we're just going to hop right into it. Maribel Ramos was born in November of 1976, and she was actually born in Mexico with her and her family, but later moved to the States, more specifically Orange County, California, when she was a baby. From a young age, Maribel was a tomboy, but she was also described as a very maternal person. She loved to take care of people. She was so sweet and so kind to everyone that she met. And on top of that, Maribel was also just gorgeous. And so a lot of the boys at school had crushes on her. And she was said to have a very maternal nature. Now, this was mostly because she was the oldest out of all her siblings. And she would most of the time take care of her younger siblings while her single mother worked two jobs. Maribel knew that at a very young age, with her being the oldest, it was going to take a lot of responsibility in order to help her family out of the financial situation that they were in and it was always her dream to one day make enough money to support her family and help out her mom so that her mom can spend more time with her kids. And so in high school is when Maribel decided that she wanted to go to the police academy and become a police officer. After high school she went to the police academy but then became a security guard at a local grocery store and she worked there for a couple years until eventually going into the army in August of 2001. Two years later, in 2003, that is when the Iraq War had started. U.S. forces invaded Iraq in an attempt to disarm their weapons and mass destruction and to end the president at the time, Saddam Hussein, who was in support of things like terrorism and the U.S. wanted to free the Iraqi people. And during this war, Maribel was actually deployed out to Iraq where she saw a lot of combat. Even after the war, she ended up staying in the army for eight more years and during those years she was even deployed out to Afghanistan. That was until eight years later in the year of 2009 at the age of 33 years old that's when Maribel decided to leave the army. She at this point had worked her way up to sergeant and so she did have a very high position in the army but she just knew that she wanted to get her life started. She didn't want to just be in the army her whole life. She wanted to go out there and have fun and experience what life was actually like. And then when she left the army, that is when she would attend the California State University in Fullerton and majored in criminal justice. But unfortunately, once Maribel did leave the army and went straight into school, she was struggling a lot with PTSD because as I said, she was in war and she also was in the army like on the field for eight years. You definitely have seen the worst of the worst at that point, but she kind of have had her school work to distract her and so when she got into school she immediately threw her everything into her schoolwork. She made sure to dedicate herself to every class that she was in. She was getting good grades in every class that she was in and for the first two years of college her freshman and sophomore she actually had a dorm until her third year her junior year in 2012. She realized that she didn't want a dorm anymore just because the dorms honestly surprisingly it's a lot more expensive to get a dorm at a university versus paying rent at a nearby apartment away from the university. And so in her third year, she just couldn't afford the dorm tuitions anymore. So she decided to go out and get a place of her own. But being a college student, and she was working at the time, but she actually worked at her college. So she wasn't making much. She knew that she wasn't able to move out on her own. She wouldn't be able to afford it. And so that is when one day she went on Craigslist and found 53-year-old Kwong Choi, aka Casey. Casey was actually born in China with his family, but then moved to Tennessee when he was a young toddler. And he actually just recently moved to California from Tennessee after accepting a great job offer in chemistry. Now, I'm unsure who posted the ad for the need of a roommate. I don't know if Maribel posted the ad, and I don't know if Casey posted the ad, but in the end, they both met each other 
other on Craigslist. They ended up DMing each other, getting to know each other a little bit before buying a two bedroom apartment together. Casey was described by family and friends as to be very shy, very awkward. He didn't really know how to act in social settings. He spoke English, but he spoke English with a very thick accent. So sometimes it was hard for him to communicate with others. And so because of the major language barrier, he didn't really go out too much. He didn't really have many friends. And Maribel being Maribel, she was kind and sweet to everyone that she met. She saw Casey and she decided to, you know, bring him out of his comfort zone a little bit. So that's when Maribel started to invite Casey to hang out with her friends. She would invite him to have drinks with her friends, to have dinner. She would go and hang out with him. Like they would go on walks together and just, you know, bring him more outside of his comfort zone and get to know him a little bit more. And the following year in May of 2013, Maribel's life started to really look up for her. At this time, she was finishing up her final year in college. So she was about to get her degree soon. And on top of that, she also had some really, really amazing internships lined up for her post-grad. At the time, she wasn't really in a serious or dedicated relationship. She was more just kind of dating around. So her love life was even exciting. Maribel really wasn't seeing anyone exclusively. She's in her 30s, you know, so she's just kind of having fun, dating around, looking into the love scene. And as far as Casey and Maribel's relationship, as I said, Casey is 53 years old and at the time Maribel was 36 years old. So there is a major age gap, almost 20 years of an age gap. Maribel kind of viewed Casey just more as an older, wiser figure or an older friend that she would just hang out with, a wholesome brother-sister relationship. It wasn't anything romantic, or at least it wasn't for Maribel. On May 3rd of 2013, Maribel's sister got a text from Casey saying that Maribel never came home the day before. Casey was known to be very protective of Maribel. As I said, they had a very brother-sister relationship, and so he tended to take care of Maribel. And he said that usually he always sees her once in the morning and once when they get off of work at night. He did say that he saw her yesterday morning, but as for last night, she never came home from work. And so he just kind of assumed that maybe she was staying out late with friends, but then he woke up the next morning and realized that she never even came home. So he tried calling her and texting her, but there was no response. When Maribel's family was made aware that Maribel wasn't answering her phone, her family didn't really freak out too much at first because as I said, Maribel is a strong, independent woman. She has been in the army for eight years. Like she is definitely a woman who can take care of herself. So they weren't really worried about her. They were just like, oh, maybe she lost her phone. But it wasn't until later on that night, Maribel was actually a part of a local softball team and they had games every weekend, which Maribel never ever skipped a game. And if she did, she was always really good about telling them if she was gonna be off that day or if she was gonna be late. But it really, really concerned the family when later on that night, when the softball game came around, Maribel never showed up and never called. So at this point, that's when the family decided to call the police as well. They called the police and the following day, missing persons posters were being posted up all over the town, all over online. Search teams were going out. There was a lot of news and media coverage on the case as well. So the police start investigating this missing persons case and they go over to Maribel and Casey's apartment and right off the bat, the police are noticing some really odd things. Before they even walk into the apartment, they find that Maribel's car is still parked in the driveway. But even weirder, when the police go inside the apartment and they start looking around, they find that Maribel's phone and keys are gone, but her other important things like her purse, her wallet, her identification is still all there. And so immediately the police are just seeing things that are not adding up. How is it that her keys are gone, but her car is downstairs in the driveway? And how is it that her phone is gone, but her wallet is still here? First, police were just assuming that maybe Maribel had run away, but this told them that this was definitely not just her running away. This was gonna be a lot more than that. Family, friends, and even Maribel's school all tried to aid in the help for the search of Maribel. But no matter how hard everyone looked, there was truly just no sign of Maribel. 
police got into all of the security cameras within the area and they didn't find Maribel on any of them. They tried to get witness statements. They tried talking to friends, talking to family. They even sweeped for fingerprints or footprints, but they couldn't find anything. It was simply as just Maribel had vanished. That was until the police started to look into the security footage of the apartment building. The only cameras they had in the building was guarding the front, guarding the back, and guarding the manager's office. They find that on May 2nd, the night before Casey had called Maribel in missing, Maribel was seen on camera going up to the manager's office with a white envelope, sliding that envelope inside of the door, and walking away. And it was later confirmed that this envelope was actually her rent money. In the footage, she's seen wearing her pajamas and the envelope. She doesn't seem to be holding her phone or her keys anywhere. She's also wearing very loose-fitting pajamas as if she just came from her apartment. And this was probably one of the biggest pieces of evidence so far for the police because if you remember from earlier, Casey said on the police phone call that the last time he saw Maribel was the day before in the morning and then when he got home from work, he didn't see her at all at night. But this security footage was taken at 8.20 p.m. So clearly Casey was lying. And on top of that, she's wearing pajamas that she most likely got from her apartment and she was most likely walking back to her apartment. But before jumping into conclusions and trying to accuse Casey, they decide to interview other suspects first, starting with Maribel's boyfriend, Paul Lopez. Now, the only reason police thought that Paul Lopez was Maribel's boyfriend was because Casey told police that Paul Lopez was Maribel's boyfriend. But when he was brought into the station, Paul was a little confused because he was like, no, I'm not Maribel's boyfriend. We went on one date recently. Uh, Maribel was on a bunch of dating apps such as Plenty of Fish, and that's where her and Paul had met. He said that they weren't exclusive at all. She was dating other guys and he was dating other girls. It was just more of a casual sort of thing, which was actually true because when they looked into Maribel's Plenty of Fish profile, they found that Maribel actually had a date already set up on May 5th, two days before she went missing. But Paul was actually later cleared because Paul is a truck driver and that night of May 2nd when she was last seen, he was driving an overnight truck route and through like the GPS tracker that he has on the company truck, they saw that he was nowhere near Maribel that night. And so since the police don't have Maribel's phone, the police tried to get in contact with Maribel's phone provider in hopes of trying to find some sort of call logs or recent things that may tell them something. What they found interesting was that the week before, Maribel had actually called the police. Hi, it's not an emergency, but I just, um, is it recording? Is that what? Is this conversation recording? Yes, every conversation is recorded. I'm just like calling so that you guys know that if something happens, I did it because I was trying to defend myself. All I'm trying to say is that I'm warning you. Um, honestly, I will fight for my life and I swear I will, I will kill him. His full name is Juan Chul. But what I understand is Juan Chul Joy. She seems very scared, very frantic, and she doesn't really go into deep detail why she's afraid of Kwong, but in the call, you can definitely tell that she is fearful. And as I said, Maribel is the type of girl that is independent, she's strong. Maribel can hold herself up if she needed to. And so the fact that she was scared for her life really, really made the police concerned as to how bad Casey had actually treated her. Because the way that Casey was saying their friendship to the police. Casey was saying like, oh, me and Maribel, we love each other. We always like go out together. She loves me and we take care of each other. You don't typically call the police on your friends or be fearful of your friends. So the police actually tried to get into contact with Casey the night of that he made the phone call to declare her missing on May 3rd. But when they went to the place, Casey was nowhere to be found. They eventually did get a hold of Casey 
see the next day and they asked him, where were you yesterday? Like we went to your house and you weren't there. And Casey actually said that he was home that day, but he was actually in his car with binoculars and a notebook, basically doing his own surveillance on the home. And he had actually seen the police walk up, but didn't say anything. So that detail alone was a little bit odd, but as interrogators are talking to Casey, they look down and what they find is that Casey has tons of scratches all over his arms. So the police ask him like, hey, what's wrong with your arm? Where did all these scratches come from? And Casey, I'm assuming panics a little bit because he goes on this 15 minute rant of a story that I'm not even going to show you because it makes no sense. And there's so many times where he backtracks or what he says doesn't really add up or make sense to what he said earlier. Casey claims that how he got these scratches was that one day him and Maribel were walking a trail and he saw a dog that was close by to a pond and then the dog ended up falling into the water and couldn't swim and so Casey being the hero that he is he ran into the pond and as he was like trying to rescue this dog his arms got cut up with fishing lines and so as I said as he's saying this story he keeps on stuttering he's saying things that don't make sense it's just really really hard to go through and so the police clearly know that this is a fake story so the police at this point are just kind of fed up with Casey's lying and they just straight up tell him we know you're lying because the police tell him we know you're lying because you told us that the last time you saw Maribel was the morning of May 2nd and she never came home the night of May 2nd but we actually have security footage of her in the apartment building paying her rent the night of May 2nd and going back to her apartment which you claim to be in so there's no way you couldn't have seen her and on top of that Maribel actually called the police last week saying that she was afraid of what you might do to her and so when the police tell Casey all this he goes into a panic he starts you know making up all of these lies until eventually he starts to slowly confess to what actually happened that night he said that on May 2nd in the morning he did see Maribel that day but the night of May 2nd he also did see Maribel that night he said that him and Maribel were drinking that night and all of a sudden Maribel became extremely violent and started yelling at him the two of them got into an argument over rent because recently Casey had lost his job and Maribel was covering his portion of the rent which made Maribel extremely mad because it's not her responsibility to be paying his rent and this started a huge argument between the two or Maribel had took her rent money stormed out he went into his room locked and shut his door and just went to sleep he said the following morning when he didn't see Maribel he got kind of concerned because he thought that maybe she ran away in the middle of the night maybe she went out to go clear her head because of the fight and accidentally got lost so that is when he tried to call her text her he got no response he started to get a little worried so he called the police and then called Called Maribel's sister. Now, this is just what Casey told police. What police later found out, what was the real reason that Maribel was mad at him. That night, it was true. They both did get into an argument. Whether or not they were drinking, we have no clue, but they did get into an argument, but it was not because, you know, Casey had lost his job and she was covering his rent. It was because Casey had lost his job two months ago and told Maribel, hey, is it okay if you cover my part of the rent? I'll pay you back as soon as I get this new job. And Maribel ended up covering his portion of the rent for two months that she couldn't afford. And then one day, Maribel had actually found out that Casey had just recently spent $12,000 on an age reversing surgery that was coming up soon. So basically, instead of Casey spending his savings, his $12,000 on rent and being responsible so Maribel didn't have to pay it, he instead took that money and got age reversing surgery and said, it's okay, you got this Maribel, like you're gonna cover my portion of the rent and I'm gonna look 10 years younger. And so obviously Maribel was very furious 
because no way Casey just has $12,000 while she's struggling to pay his portion of the rent. So that night she confronted him about it and she gave him an ultimatum. She said, either you pay me this month's rent plus the two others that you missed or you can leave tonight. And this started up an argument because Casey had a little crush on Maribel. He did not view Maribel as a roommate. He viewed her as a girlfriend, as the love of his life. And as you will see later, Casey refers to Maribel as his love. And Casey felt very offended that Maribel viewed him as just a roommate to get rent out of rather than a boyfriend, which again, Casey is 53 years old. Maribel is only 36 years old. That's a whole 20 year difference. There's no way that that is going to happen. But for some reason, he felt so entitled to her love or entitled to have her as a girlfriend. And so that is when she stormed out to pay her rent and he stormed into his room. Please know Maribel is missing. So something must have happened to Maribel. Something must have happened between the time that she got back from paying her rent to the time the next morning when Casey had called her in missing. And so the police don't believe that Casey just simply went to sleep after the fight. They believe that Casey did something more. Casey immediately just shuts down. He doesn't want to deal with it anymore. And he simply just says, if I'm not being arrested, I'd like to leave. And the police by law have to let him leave because at this point, all they have is theories and you can't arrest someone on theories. Even if it was like conspiracy to commit, they would need a little bit of evidence in order for that. The only evidence they had was a slip up in his story and that wasn't enough to arrest him. On May 8th, 2013, two days after Casey and the police had their interrogation, Maribel's friend Emily was actually posting on a bunch of Yelp reviews of like different bars and stores in Orange County, a bunch of places that Maribel frequently went to. Her friend Emily was posting on a bunch of Yelp reviews saying, quote, my friend Maribel Ramos has been missing since Thursday, May 2nd. She was last seen at her apartment in Orange County, California. Please help her family, friends, and I to find her. If you have any information as to her whereabouts, please call Detective Ramirez or Orange Police Watch Commander. Please share this link with your friends and family. We need all the help we can get. And there was a bunch of people that were, you know, giving her sympathy. Have hope. She's out there somewhere. She'll come home. Hopefully she comes home fine and healthy. But there was one commenter that replied to this saying, quote, have they talked to the roommate yet? And someone replied to that saying, quote, Yes, they spoke to the roommate. He willingly cooperated with the cops by giving them DNA samples and even allowed them to take naked photos of him. He gave up his cell phone to them so that he couldn't contact anyone, which he was all more than happy to do. And you will never expect it, but in this commenter thread, Casey, Casey himself actually pops in the conversation and says, quote, I am Maribel's roommate. She is my best friend and my only family. She is absolutely the best woman I've ever met. We had so much fun together. I miss her so much. She always knew that I will give my life for her without any hesitation. Police forensic team searched this two-bedroom apartment five times with the police dog. They confiscated computer, hard drive, cell phone, car, and took several items. They contacted everyone on my phone list, and I don't know when I will get my properties back. These are major inconveniences, but all these don't matter. I miss Maribel. That really makes me depressed and stressed out big time. I also want to point two things out real quick. Casey's profile picture is actually of him and Maribel as if to like insinuate that the two were dating and Casey actually made his account back in 2011 and it's currently 2013. So he didn't just make this account to post this comment. I thought I should mention that before moving forward. And underneath Casey's comment, he was receiving a lot of sympathy. A lot of people were saying, 
how sorry they were for him and like I know this must be hard on you and I'm so sorry you have to go through this but there was one Yelp commenter that kind of called Casey out a little bit. Am I the only one finding it odd that this Casey roommate posted here and used past tense to refer to Maribel? Quote unquote, we had, she already knew, as opposed to we have or she knows. And why would she ask him to move out if they were having so much fun together? My prayers are with the friends and family. This is very sad. And honestly, this wording is very, very odd. If you were a police officer or a detective and you were reading someone like a suspect that you had, if you were reading what they were saying and they used past tense, this would be a huge, huge red flag. But there were a a lot of people coming to Casey's defense. And there was one comment that even read, quote, did you create an account just to post that? I don't know Maribel or her roommate personally, but why don't we just let the police do their job and not speculate on who's responsible for her disappearance until they at least have a suspect? Perhaps the roommate is using past tense simply because he hasn't seen her in a while and fears the worst. We will all find out what happened in due time. Until then, we should be focusing on Maribel Maribel and not turning this into a witch hunt. And Casey actually responded to this person who was calling him out about his weird wording and said, quote, thank you for correcting my grammar. That is my second language and I still need help from time to time. Yes, Maribel and I are best friends. She is my family. This is big and it puts so much depression and stress on my life. Police came by my house for the fifth time last night with a big bloodhound. Please do not speculate or make judgment on me. That is already done by others and I know that everyone is looking at me that way. Honestly, I would not hesitate a second to give my life for Maribel. And although there were a lot of people defending Casey, there was a lot of people that were very suspicious of Casey. And one commenter even asked, why does he have Maribel in his profile? profile picture as if they were dating. And he says, quote, my profile photo. I did it because I miss her. That is one from one night we went out. I don't see anything wrong with putting a photo with your friend and or one you love. There was also a candle visual that was being held for Maribel and Casey actually attended the candle visual and someone saw him there and said, quote, Casey, I saw you at the visual. Why did you sit far away at a distance? Why are you uncomfortable? And he replies with quote, one of Maribel's family members asked me why I was there. Also a verbal threat when I was there. I was uncomfortable that the police and or police are assuming or insinuating that I am a suspect. Police and family are assuming that. I understand that we are all concerned about her, especially I am more than anyone else. Yes, she is my only family and I will give my life for her. Is that love? People can assume all they want and express their opinions. And after that, it seemed like the conversation with Casey was done because after that, no one really started to talk about Casey in the thread. Everyone was just kind of giving their condolences to Maribel and trying to figure out where she was and if there's any updates on her. And now at this point in the thread, since no one's really talking about Casey, Casey pops back into the thread and just talks about his life insurance insurance policy and he says quote I said Maribel is my only family and best friend she is she is the only beneficiary for my $250,000 life insurance and only beneficiary for my bank account paid upon death she knows this I miss her every second I am awake sad face emoji. And so that was kind of odd, kind of random, because literally who asked, why do we need to know that she was your beneficiary? Why do we need to know the exact amount of your life insurance policy? And so someone ended up calling him out on this weirdness and saying, quote, this is not an accusal, just a personal observation. My condolences firsthand. Casey, you need to be more careful about the kind of content you are posting, where you are posting it, and the audience that you are dealing with. In this case, it would be very personal information posted on the internet to complete strangers who do not really know the entirety of the story and have no obligation to come to your defense. I hate to point this out, but the stuff you write makes you susceptible to doubt. I don't see a reason for posting up information about life insurance and bank account beneficiaries. 
paid upon death, she knows this, etc. Statements of only family and love for a roommate. You may be outraged that I'm pointing this out, but I am showing you what an uninvolved third party may think of your statements and process of posting. Rant at me if you wish. I understand the need and desire to defend your reputation as well as your concern for your missing roommate. Just be more careful about who and how you are asking for help. And Casey actually responds to this comment and all he says is, quote, Thanks for the good advice. I just can't think straight these days. Police at this point are running out of options. They have talked to everyone in Maribel's life, every ex-boyfriend, every friend, every family member, every person that may or may not have liked Maribel, but there was absolutely no leads and the only suspect they had left was Casey. But it was just extremely hard to convict Casey because they had absolutely nothing on Casey. It was true that what Casey said in the Yelp reviews, the police went to his house five times with search teams, with bloodhounds. They confiscated his cell phone, his computer, his car. They scanned everything for fingerprints, scanned all of his history, and there was absolutely nothing on there. They couldn't find anything suspicious or any sort of insinuation that maybe Maribel and Casey had a rocky relationship or maybe Maribel didn't like Casey. They couldn't even find anything wrong with the apartment. They found no blood, no dents, no odd scratches. And so since everything came back completely normal, the police started to doubt themselves a little bit and think, well, maybe Casey actually is innocent. There was still so many unanswered questions as to why Maribel's keys were gone, but her car was still in the driveway. Where even is Maribel's phone and keys when in the security footage of when she was last seen, she had nothing in her pocket? Why did Maribel call the police the week before saying that she was scared of Casey? The police just knew that Casey had something to do with this, but he was just doing a really good job at covering it up. So that is when they sent out a team to follow Casey and try to figure out his daily routine, where he went, and what they know noticed is that Casey actually spent a lot of time at the public library, more specifically using the public library computers. So one day when Casey was using the public computers at the library, a undercover cop went in and decided to sit behind Casey to kind of peer over his shoulder and see what he was looking at. This undercover cop physically saw Casey type in, can a cell phone be traced if it's turned off? And so after this, the police knew that there was some something going on. They knew that they had a possible lead. And so the next day they got a warrant from the library in order to access the computer that Casey was using and kind of look at Casey's screen in live time from a van outside. In the beginning when he was using the computer, he was just doing normal things. He was checking his email. He was submitting a few applications for jobs until randomly Casey goes to Google Maps and types in a van very specific address, he types in 8548 Peters Canyon Trail in California, which is basically a trail in what seems to be like the middle of nowhere. Then as Casey is looking at this address, he starts to zoom in on a very specific part of this forest and he's going in, he's zooming in, he's changing like the views to where it's like satellite version, just kind of investigating that one portion. Portion. And when the police saw that, they got a really, really dark feeling about this. So the police went out to that address and they went out to the specific spot that Casey was zooming in on. And there they would find the dead body of 36-year-old Maribel Ramos. It was said that Maribel's body must have been there since May 2nd, the night that she went missing. So at this point, her body was badly decomposed after the past eight days when she was found and on top of that the animals had actually gone to her as well. Casey was found that day and arrested and weirdly when he was arrested Casey was actually found wearing Maribel's dog tags that Maribel actually always wore. Casey's trial began in 2014 and he pled not guilty. Unfortunately the cause of Maribel's death couldn't be determined because as I said her body was very badly decomposed and although the police 
police didn't really have much physical evidence against Casey, it was very obvious that Casey did have something to do with this. Casey didn't have a straightforward story to combat any suspicion off of him. And one of the main reasons why people pointed fingers at Casey was because it's very, very common in a lot of murder cases for the murderer to return to the scene of the crime as if to sort of relive that moment again. And they believe that this is what Casey was doing when he looked at the location on Google Maps. He was specifically zooming in on the place that Maribel was later found at. So it seemed like Casey didn't want to go to the location. So he just looked up the location on Google Maps to sort of relive everything that went on that night. It's also very common in murder cases for the murderer to take trophies of their victims. And as I said, Casey was found wearing Maribel's dog tags. The court also found it very, very odd that Casey was responding to conspiracies about him on the Yelp reviews. And also they brought up at court how Casey used past tense to refer to Maribel. And this also kind of ties into another murderer trait. A lot of murderers tend to be very narcissistic in their killings. They tend to only think of themselves and they love to look at what people think of them. A really big uh, example of this is if you guys have ever seen the Netflix documentary Don't F With Cats, Don't F With Cats is about a murderer named Luca Magnata. And Luca was on the run for a couple of months. Like there was a manhunt for Luca. And the only reason the police found Luca was because he was at a local internet cafe looking at articles about himself and about the murders that he convicted and all of like these search teams that are coming out to find him. And that's how he got caught. And in this same situation, Casey was reading things about himself and that's how he got caught. He decided to reach into it. He decided to engage. He soaked up all the sympathy that he could get. And then when people weren't talking about him anymore, he randomly pops in with beneficiary information to hopefully get a reaction out of people again. Now, as far as Casey's defense to all of this, Casey didn't really have much of a defense because what can you even say to this? Casey did have one defense and it was to when the police were looking at Casey's computer from outside. Casey said that he actually wasn't the one that looked up that address and zoomed in on that location. And it was actually a hacker that did all of that. He said that at the same time the police were looking at the computer, a hacker who just so happened to be the murderer hacked into Casey's computer, zoomed in on that specific location location in order to frame Casey, which the court completely just laughed at. Like that is not even a theory at all. There's no possible way that could happen. What the police believed actually happened was that night when Maribel and Casey got into an argument over rent, Maribel did storm out of the place, pay her side of the rent. But then when she got back to the apartment, that is when she was attacked and killed by Casey. They believed that the reason Casey got so angry with Maribel is because he had a very, very scary crush on Maribel. He couldn't fathom the fact that Maribel didn't view him in the same way that he viewed Maribel, which again, it's not Maribel's job to like him or have interest in him. If she doesn't, that should be the end of that. But Casey couldn't take no for an answer. And this was actually later confirmed at the trial because Maribel's sister went to testify and said that one day Casey had actually called her and said, hey, I'm in love with your sister, Maribel. I love her so much. She means the world to me. She's my favorite person. I'm going to marry her one day. And Maribel's sister knew that Maribel didn't like Casey like that. So she tried to let him down slowly and say, oh, you know, Casey, you're a great guy. You're so sweet, so kind, and you're going to find someone that loves you very, very much but I just don't think it's going to be my sister. The court ended up finding him guilty for the second degree murder of Maribel Ramos, and he was sentenced to 15 years to life without possibility of parole. As far as the aftermath of everything, Casey actually had a chance to make a statement to Maribel's family in which he said, quote, her family wants me to apologize, which I cannot apologize for something I haven't done. 
I miss Maribel more than anyone. I think about it. I've been in here for 440 days in this cell. I think about her almost every day. Maybe someday the truth will come out. Maybe I'll just die inside this prison. And even after he was convicted, he had wrote dozens and dozens of letters to the judge asking him to have mercy on him, to release him from prison. He even wrote dozens of letters to the ABC Eyewitness News and tried to get the news media to cover his story and try to get him out of prison. He denies everything. He denies that he had anything to do with Maribel's death and he still preaches innocence, which I think is extremely disrespectful. I think it's disgusting. I think it's terrible that he doesn't even at least give the family closure on what happened. And I absolutely hate when he says things like, I am the one who is the most sad here, or I am more sad than everyone else. And out of everyone, out of Maribel's family, out of her friends, he is the one that feels the worst. And I hate that. I hate that he's comparing his grieving to other people's grieving. I hate that he makes it a competition, but because he still pleads innocence, to this day, we still don't know what happened to Maribel. It's believed that he could have strangled her because there was no gunshots that were heard. There was no screaming. But yeah, even to this day, and as we're speaking right now, Casey is in prison in California serving out his life sentence. But as I said, he got 15 years to life. So there is a possibility that Casey might be out in 2029. As far as Maribel's softball team, as I said, Maribel was a part of a softball team. They, shortly after everything had happened, after Maribel's body, was found, they actually did a charity game in order to help Maribel's family fund all of the funeral costs and their lawyers. But yeah, that is the end of today's case. If you guys found this case interesting, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you're on YouTube or if you're on Spotify, Apple, wherever you can find podcasts. Make sure to rate it five stars because that really helps me out a lot. If you want to follow me on any of my socials, like my Instagram, that will be linked down below, as well as my PO box. If you want to send me anything. And I would love to hear what you guys think about the case in the comments below. Do you think Casey should have gotten a life sentence or do you think that 15 years to life is a good sentence to have? Do you think Casey should be released after 15 years or do you think he should live the rest of his life in prison? Or do you even believe that Casey had anything to do with this? Do you think that Casey's telling the truth or do you think he's clearly lying and he definitely had something to do with it? But yeah, that is all for me. I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. Make sure to go outside today, get some fresh air, be safe out there, and as always, I love you, I love you, I love you, and I will see you guys next week. Bye!